Come on, give a shout to the Lord tonight. Hallelujah. Come on, come on. Praise you, Father. Hallelujah. We give you honor. We give you glory in this place tonight. For we are not the devil's property. We belong to God. You are God. You don't ever change. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. We thank you and praise you here tonight in this congregation. Now, Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. And I receive a fresh touch of the anointing of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' mighty name. And all the people said, Amen. Come on, give him praise tonight. Give him a shout of praise. Hallelujah. Well, glory to God. Be seated if you can. I love that song. <laughs> thank you for singing it. I haven't heard that. The, the la you know, the last time I heard that song, I was preaching in Hawaii. I was at Art and Kuna Sepulveda's church, word of, word of life, word of faith, word of life, whatever the name of it is. And, um, and they, um, they were singing that song. I'd never heard it before. This is year, some years ago, maybe 10 years ago. And I'd never heard it. And I just, I fell in love with it. And there was a group, there was a Hawaiian family that had a, a re Hawaiian review show they did every night in a nightclub. But they were all there at the service to hear me. And, uh, uh, and afterwards they said, would you come to our show uh, tomorrow night? We said, well, sure. So it was a dinner show, you know, and it's like a, like a nightclub show. Uh, all Christians, but spirit-filled Christians, but they, they did this nightclub show. So in the middle of it, they said, we're going to have an Elvis Presley uh, contest. Amen. And we're going to call five people out of the audience. And I, I started sitting lower in my seat, lower in my seat, and my daughters started pointing like this. Because they knew that I had known Elvis. And, um, and sure enough, I got called. So they called, they took the five of us back, and they made us get undressed and put on an Elvis costume. And a wig, an Elvis wig. And... Um, uh, and we had to come out, and each one of us uh, were given uh, lyrics to one of his songs on a track, and we had to sing an Elvis Presley song. Wow. <laughs> so I sang Heartbreak Hotel. <laughs> and I won the contest, and I have a certificate on my wall. Of course, my children filmed it, you know. They put it all over the Internet, naturally. But anyway, that, that reminded me of that when you sang that tonight. But thank you for singing that. I love that song, praise God. So glad to be with you guys tonight. Amen. To be here in, in Aurora in the greater Chicago area and to be with Pastor Jeff and Christine and, and to see s those of you that I have met in the past, the Watsons and, and others. Uh, God bless you and thank you for this invitation. I'm like the Holy Spirit. I go where I'm welcomed. Amen. I go where I'm invited. Amen. And I praise God for that. I got to know them through Pastor Nancy Dufresne in, in California. Uh, Pastor Nancy is very, very close to my wife, Lindsay, and me. And uh, Lindsay was praying for me just before I came to the service tonight. She asked me to tell you she's praying over you. I know her. I know she's on her face before the Lord right now. And she said, call me the minute you get finished, and I'll stop praying. <laughs> so, so she's like that. She knows when I'm on the platform, and she knows what I'm doing, and I thank God for that. Praise God. I have a question to ask you. Is it okay if I just be myself tonight? Okay. Um, I, I, you know, I, I was performing a wedding in Tulsa at a local church, and I came in early to kind of get a, a lay of the land and to see what the family wanted me to do. And, and I was up kind of organizing the platform, and there was a lady that was doing the flowers. And she, she said, I just don't know what to call you. Reminded me of what you said a minute ago. I don't know what to call you. You know, I said, well, I always preferred your majesty. <laughs> just, just Richard will do. <laughs> good enough for my mama. It's good enough for me. <laughs> uh, um, I grew up in the home of Oral Roberts. Um, and I, I had a tough time. Uh, because although I loved my father, uh, I was the butt of all the jokes and all the criticism and uh, all that came against me as a child. I loved the healing ministry. I loved to stand by my father's side. I loved to hear him preach. And sometimes he would preach an hour and a half, sometimes two hours would wear us out. And then pray for the sick for three hours after that, you know. <laughs> and uh, his services were long, and, but I loved to go. 
and oftentimes he would come and have me stand beside him in the healing line and sometimes you know he would turn to me and have me pray for the people I loved that but I didn't like being the ob the object of all the jokes and I didn't like to have people run up run up behind me and put their hands on me and yell heal and then laugh and the teacher would laugh and and uh, they would bring newspaper articles into the classroom and and it was tough it was difficult and uh, those were those were tough days. I came home with some bloody noses, and I left some bloody noses too. I was an equal opportunity person, you understand. And uh, uh, somebody took a swing at me. They they uh, they got two back because uh, I, I believe in seed faith. Uh, 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 and I, I started singing uh, at a very early age. I don't know what age you started, but I started when I was five. Uh, my, my dad stood me up on a chair in Baltimore, Maryland, in front of 10,000 people, sang my first song in public in front of 10,000 people, saying, I believe. You know the song, I believe for every drop of rain that falls in that song? It's, it's an old gospel song. Uh, but anyway, I, that's how I got my start, singing. And uh, all through those years, I, I, was, I was singing. My dad wanted me to use my talent for God, but I wanted to use it for the world. And by the time I was 15, I was the lead singer in a rock and roll band. And, uh, and this is the 60s now, the mid-60s mid when I was in high school. And uh, I was traveling all over the state making good money. And I wasn't interested in God. I told my dad, get the hell out of my life. And he said, well, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get the <laughs> hell out of your life. And I was doing everything that young people did in those days as they were going away from God. And I wasn't interested in the ministry. I wanted to be a star. I'd been offered a, a contract uh, to sing at the Kansas City Starlight Theater, which I did, and I was performing in clubs in Kansas City, and I was going as a student uh, to the University of Kansas at the time. My dad had built Oral Roberts University, but that was the last place on earth I wanted to go. So I went away, and uh, then I was offered a contract uh, to sing in the lounges of the Sahara Hotel in Las Vegas, and uh, I was going to go and become a star and I was gonna come back home and jam it down their throats. And a funny thing happened to me on the way to Las Vegas. I was hospitalized uh, and uh, I was facing colon surgery. And I was in the University of Kansas Medical Center in Lawrence, Kansas and uh, in a ward full of other young men uh, laying in the bed and I began to call on the one I was running from. It's amazing who you call on when you get in trouble. <laughs> a man said to me, I don't believe in miracles. I said, well, you will when you need one. <laughs> when you need one, it changed. your theology will change. And I needed a miracle. They were going to do surgery the next day, and I, I, I did not want to go through that surgery, and I knew what the outcome possibly could be. It was very dangerous. And I said to the Lord, if you will heal me, I will serve you. And you know, the next morning, doctors came and examined me and they couldn't find the problem. I'd felt the power of God go through my body that night. Came into my feet, came up my legs, came into my body, and I knew something had changed and the doctors couldn't find the problem. And they did more tests and the problem was gone. The doctor came in and said, we don't know what happened, but you don't have to have surgery. Well, God had kept his part of the bargain took me a little while longer to do my part of the bargain. <laughs> Another year passed and Kenneth Copeland uh, was a student at the University in Tulsa and uh, he came and prophesied to my father over me. He said, Richard is not running from you, he's running from God and he's coming home. And the following year I came home but I just came home uh, with my body. Everything else was the same. I was just I said to the Lord, okay, I'll come home, but, but I, I'm not going to really have anything to do with you. And uh, I was singing. I helped. Uh, I, I was part of a choir, and we began to travel some, and, and uh, I was up uh, performing in Chicago. How many of you have heard of Chicago? <laughs> uh, I was performing in Chicago, and I got sick again. And uh, I was raging with fever, and I lost my voice. And I, I, couldn't, I could hardly stand up, I was so sick. And they put me in the bus and drove back to Tulsa and put me in my old bedroom in my parents' home. Now by now I was finished, I'd finished my, 
my, actually I was in my third year of college. And uh, my mother came in and said, your father's in California preaching, but he'll be home tomorrow. And uh, he'll come in and pray for you and God will heal you. Well, he and I had been estranged since I was in high school. And there wasn't much conversation between us. But when he came home the next day and he came into my bedroom, it was like old times. I had a need. And he reached out his hand to pray for me as he had done many times before. But before he touched me, he withdrew his hand and he said to me, I had no idea. And I said, what do you mean? He said, I had no idea that the anointing for healing was on you as strong as it is. And I said, what do you mean? He said, God is going to give you a different kind of healing ministry. It will not be a laying on of hands ministry. It will be a word of knowledge ministry. I didn't know what a word of knowledge was. He said, I see you standing before great crowds. I see you in nations around the earth. I see you with presidents and prime ministers and kings and queens of nations. And uh, then he laid his hands on me and instantly the fever left. My voice returned. I, my strength was healed. And uh, I rolled out of the bed and got on my knees. And I said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. I gave my heart to Jesus. That evening back in the dormitory, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And my life went a different direction. I didn't know how God was going to use me. Suddenly, I wanted to be used. I didn't know, I, had not, I didn't, had not known that he would call me to preach. I did not know that he would give me a healing ministry. I did not know that I would be on television since 1969. I didn't know that I would minister. You know, I've been in 55 countries. I didn't know that I would uh, have crusades and have crowds up to 200,000 in one service. I didn't know that I would lay hands on 35 presidents and heads of state. I didn't know. All I knew was once I was lost, and now I was found. And, and my life was transformed, and I joined my father's ministry and stood faithfully by his side for 40 years. What he did, I did. Where he went, I went. What he said, I said. What he wrote, I wrote. In fact, I helped him write most of, a lot of what he wrote. Uh, we wrote books together. We wrote letters together. We raised funds together. Uh, we preached together. We had healing service together. We were like a father and son team for some 40 years. And when he went home to be with the Lord, he said a double portion of his spirit would come upon me. And that's what I had desired. I figured if Elijah, if Elijah Elisha could get it, I could get it. <laughs> because God's no respecter of persons. And I thought I should share that with you. I didn't know all the things that I would do. I began as his assistant and then I became a vice president of the university and the ministry, and then I became president of the Oral Roberts Evangelistic Association, out of which everything we've done has grown. And then after getting my master's and my doctorate degrees at the university, I became president of the university, and I served for 14 years as president of the university. And then uh, uh, 12 years ago, 13, year, 13 years ago, I, I went back into full-time healing ministry, which is my first love. And I've been traveling uh, since, since then again like I did in my younger years uh, but the Lord has changed me uh, in a number of ways and that's I'm getting to the point of where I'm going to go with this tonight about six years ago um, I, I awakened one morning early to have my prayer time it was about five o'clock the sun was not up yet Lindsay was asleep I didn't want to wake her, but I sat on the edge of the bed, and you know how you do, you kind of rub your eyes to kind of get yourself awake <clears throat> to, to go in the other room to have prayer. Clear as a bell, the Lord spoke to me and said, your crusade days are over. And I said, uh, say that again? <laughs> he said, your crusade days are over. And I said, well, what do you mean? That's what I've done for 40 years. I've preached in 35 nations. I've been all over the world, uh, and I, I assumed you wanted me to do that the rest of my life. I've seen so many healing miracles just in the past uh, 15 to 20 years. I've had more than 180,000 documented healing miracles, and those are just the ones we've heard from, you know. Yeah. And I said, Lord, what do you mean my, my crusade days are over? He said, well, do you remember a prophetic word that your dad gave you before he died? And I said, what do you mean? And he reminded me, and I'd forgotten. 
And uh, my father prophesied that when I got into my mid-60s, I would become a minister to ministers and that I would teach on healing the Holy Spirit and seed faith. Those are the three principal things of our ministry over the years. And I had forgotten the prophetic word that my father had given over me. And the Lord reminded me and he said, that's what you're going to do now. And he said, so that you know it's me, you will no longer receive any invitations from heads of state to come to their nations for crusades. And historically, I would not go to a nation unless I had an invitation from the president himself because it paved the way. There was no red tape to cut through. When the president invites you, they lay out the red carpet. And that's how, of course, my father had told me years earlier that, I, that he went into the back door of nations, but I would go through the front door. And so I've, most of the nations I've been, been in, I've had an invitation from the president or from the prime minister. And it just paved the way. Uh, including the communist president, uh, Carlo, Carlos Ortega in, uh, in Nicaragua. Wow. I got an invitation from Ortega and actually spent 30 minutes with him in his home wow. and laid hands on him because he had heart problems. And he gave me the presidential palace for the grounds. And I stood on the steps of, of the communist capital. <laughs> In fact, I can tell you a story while I was there. I went into the, I went into the, the Sandinista radio station. Uh, uh, it's, it's just communist, all communist. I went in and I walked into the lobby and there were n pictures of nude women all over the walls. The walls were covered with nude, nude p pictures. And so I went into the little studio back and, and uh, they interviewed me. And they let me preach for about an hour. And when I came back out, every picture had been taken down. <laughs> every one of them. The walls were empty. In, in Managua, Nicaragua. And then that night I went to see Ortega. But anyway, uh, that's a little story. <laughs> I have thousands of them. <laughs> so many things have happened. So um, the Lord said, you're not going to receive any more invitations from heads of state. And he said, however, you're going to start receiving invitations from ministers groups around the world to come to help underdeveloped nations ministers to teach them on the principles of healing the Holy Spirit and seed faith. And all my invitations to go overseas to preach in nations uh, for crusades dried up. Not, a, not another one came, not one. But I started being besieged by calls from pastors <laughs> from all over the world to come and to, and to do, uh, to do uh, seminars and things of that nature, conferences on healing the Holy Spirit and seed faith. And I've been doing that uh, for the past five years now all over the world. And I've just, I just did one of the most interesting things uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, thank God for technology. Yeah. You know, we Christians uh, made a terrible error uh, years ago. You know, when television and movies, you know, movies came out, we said that was of the devil. You know, and instead of embracing it and, and putting our stamp on it, and television, you know, if you had a television, you know, you're going to go to hell. And, uh, or, or if the rapture came and you're in a movie, you're going to be left behind, you know, and all that business. And when the, when the Internet came along, people said, well, the World Wide Web, you know, you can't get involved in that. Instead of saying, no, let's use this technology for the gospel. So uh, and the, if, if there's any good thing that has come out of the pandemic, it's Zoom. And churches are, are waking up and have been for the last couple of years, putting their services live on, on the internet. And, and, uh, and, 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 I, and many churches weren't doing that at all. And we have become savvy now to how to use these technologies. And so I've been doing Zoom services uh, live around the world. And just a couple of weeks ago, I did a Zoom service with 15,000 pastors in Pakistan. It was absolutely amazing. And, and the results, the healings, the baptisms of the Holy Spirit uh, are, just, are just in the same numbers as if I had been there in person. And uh, it's it absolutely amazing what is happening. And some of the nations that God told me that I would go to, I, I thought he meant I would have to go to personally. But I don't think that's what he was saying. Uh, he was saying, I'm going to send you there, but not necessarily, you know, you don't have to go in the flesh. You have to take those 18-hour plane rides, you know. In instead, I, I, we did it at 3 o'clock in the morning because it was a 10-hour time change. You know, we had to, had to be, had to give it so early. But, but I figured if I had flown into it, I'd been wide awake at 2 o'clock in the morning anyway <laughs> on the airplane, you know. 
So, but the number of healing miracles that happened among those pastors and uh, pastors that have never ever prayed in tongues, beginning to pray in tongues for the first time and learning about the principles of seed faith, it's just exactly like I was there. And so uh, the reason I'm telling you that is because tonight is healing. Tomorrow night is the Holy Spirit. Sunday morning, seed faith. And Sunday night, all heaven is going to break loose. Okay? So I, I told Pastor Jeff, I'm going to treat you tonight just the same way that I would treat these pastors in these nations around the earth. Uh, because I believe it's something that needs to be said and something that does not need to be lost in the kingdom. So uh, let's deal with healing tonight. Is it all right if we do that? Okay. And let's not only have a demonstration, but let's, let's, let's understand healing. Let's understand how important healing is and not how important healing was. How important healing is. Jesus is a healing Jesus. What he did, he is still doing. He has not gone out of the healing business. And he said, I must be about my father's business. And the Bible tells us in Exodus 15, 26, I am the Lord that healeth thee. He's not a God of the past, a God of the future. He's the God of right now. I am. He said, I am the God who heals you. So he set a pattern for healing. And all throughout the Bible, not just, just, not just in one scripture in Exodus, but all throughout the Bible, you'll find healing. And Jesus himself came to bring healing. He came to destroy the works of the devil. And sickness and disease is a work of the devil. And Satan is coming against Christians. He's coming against them with sickness and with disease. And he wants to heal you. And he wants us to take advantage of everything that he has created. He does not want us to segment him or separate him. He wants us to take advantage of everything that he has available. And what I mean by that is prayer, medical science, good diet, good climate, good exercise, you know. Thank God for your Chicago area weather, you know. 77 when I arrived here last night. It was 104 in Tulsa today. I feel like I'm on vacation, you know. I told somebody the other day, it was 102 when I was leaving, come up here. I said, if it's, if it's any hotter than this in hell, I'm not going. I'm not. I mean, we, we don't mess around. We have summer down there where we live. And there's 100, Lindsay said it's 104 this afternoon with a heat index of 112. So I said, would you please cool it off by Monday when I get home? <laughs> no, it's going to be 102 on Monday. So, but, uh, but we need to take advantage of, of everything. We shouldn't segment God and say, God, this is the only way. We shouldn't tie one of God's hands behind his back and say, God, this is the only way that you can touch me. You know, the prayer of faith, the Bible says, will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up. But he also said, they that are sick need a physician. Amen. So he put his stamp of approval on prayer. He put his stamp of approval on medicine. Thank God. And if you, if you read the book of Acts, you'll find the apostle Paul and you'll find Luke, the physician, working as a team. You have the evangelist and you have the doctor working together. And when they were on the island of Malta, Melita, they called it in those days, Malta now, you see Paul praying for the sick and them being healed, and you see Luke treating them medically and they were being healed. Now, I couldn't care less which one works. Okay? Thank the person who prays, thank the doctor who treats, but give the glory to God. Okay? This isn't rocket science, you know. And uh, we grew up, we, we grew up, at least I grew up in an era not, not in my family, but in the church. I grew up in an era where, where if you went to a doctor, you had no faith. And that's not true. That's not true. Uh, you know, you, we, we talked about Brother Hagen today. Uh, Brother Hagen's grandson's life was saved through brain surgery in the city of faith. You know. And uh, Craig, exactly. Uh, his life, the, the surgeon, the surgeon that did that was a born again, spirit filled doctor that did that, I think it was, I think he was in surgery for, you remember it was eight hours, something like that, a long time, saved his life. Thank God for doctors. They're trying to get you well. 
That's, that's not the story with a lot of pastors. A lot of pastors are concerned about your welfare. They're going, they're going to give your body to the doctor and, 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 and you take care of the rest, you know. Uh, but we need to understand that God wants us to, to use all of his sources, all of his streams, all of the streams of healing. And I've been teaching this to these pastors around the world and demonstrating how healing works, okay? Um, healing ought to be simple. It ought not be complicated. It ought to be as easy as the proverbial falling off a log. We ought to have a mindset for healing. Um, I had the most unusual experience yesterday uh, uh, because we decided uh, we decided because of all the cancellations of flights now, because, you know, you, right now the, there is a shortage of pilots because of the the demand for vaccinations and all that going on. And and if you've ever read the news, you know what I'm talking about. So we decided we decided Jeff Jeff and I said we'd drive. So we drove from Tulsa, 11 hours. We we're here in 11 hours. Stopped in Cuba, Missouri, for barbecue. <laughs> I thought Cuba was in the Caribbean, but I found out it's in the middle of Missouri. And they had some pretty doggone good barbecue, too. So it took about 11 hours to drive up here. But we were, I guess we were just north of St. Louis. And my phone rang. And I looked down at it, and it, it said, you know how your phone oftentimes says the city where it's from? It said Jacksonville, Florida. Well, I thought to myself, who's calling me from Jacksonville, Florida? Somebody trying to tell me that my warranty had run out of my car. <laughs> or you know, or that I needed a new toothbrush or what, you know, you get those crazy calls. And I thought, I'm not gonna answer that, but it just kept ringing. I thought, well, I think I will answer that. I, my curiosity got me. I wanna know who's calling me from Jacksonville. So I answered and a lady was on the line. She said, is this Richard Roberts? Yes, I need prayer. I said, I've got COVID, my husband has COVID. And she said, I'm so sorry that I'm calling you on your personal cell phone. I said, ma'am, uh, uh, what's your name? She gave me her name. I said, if you mind me asking, how'd you get my number? <laughs> she said, well, I have a search engine and I can find the phone number of anybody in America. Wow. And she said, I found your number. Wow. And I called and I apologized for calling. I said, no, it's all right. It's okay. What's going on? So uh, I said, I'm just curious. I said, I didn't know such a thing existed. Uh, so uh, she said, well, I have COVID. My, my husband has COVID. We're really suffering. We need prayer. We just need, she was crying on the phone. So I just cut loose and began praying for her. And I said, now, uh, since you have my number, <laughs> call me back tomorrow. I want to know, I want to know about the improvement. So they called me about noon today and, uh, or a little before noon, and uh, they're much better today. But uh, that's, that's what happens to me. Wherever I go, I get called for prayer. Uh, Lindsay won't go to Walmart with me. Uh, I'm, I'm liable to have a healing line in the vegetables. I've, I've prayed for people who had a head of lettuce under this arm, you know. People recognize me and from television, and, and, they, and they want prayer. And, and when, they, when, they, when they see somebody from our ministry, they see my, saw my father, they see me, they think of healing. Well... Could you receive a higher compliment than for someone to see you and think healing? So I'm, I'm a vessel of healing wherever I go. And in stores, in restaurants, in airports, in, on airplanes, wherever I go, I'm, I'm stopped, somebody, somebody wants prayer. And that's okay, I like that, because I want to be used. But getting back to uh, this, this thing about these pastors, I've been, uh, preaching a particular message to them, which I taught at Nancy's, uh, and you were there, uh, about, about uh, the healing ministry, and, I, and that's what I want to do tonight, okay? Uh, I'm taking off my, my uh, evangelist hat tonight, okay? And I'm, I'm putting on my teacher's hat, okay? Um, my dad taught me that your, your hand, your fingers on your hand uh, uh, are an example or an illustration of the five-fold ministry. He said, your thumb, everybody hold your hand up like this, he said, or hold it like this, looking at yourself. He said, your thumb represents the apostle. He said, the thumb is the base of your hand, and uh, the, the apostle is the, is, the, is the base, is the base of the ministry. And he said, now, the, your next finger is the finger that you use to point with. 
And that's the prophet who points the way. And the next finger, notice it's the longest finger. That represents the evangelist, the one who's always reaching out to the lost. And the next finger is the ring finger. That's the pastor. That's the one who's forever married to the church. And the little one is the teacher, the one that picks at the word of God, like Kenneth Copeland, who can take Jesus wept and preach on it for three hours. Okay. So you have the evangelist, you have the, the prophet, you have the, uh, excuse me, the, the apostle, the apostle, you have the prophet, you have the evangelist, you have the pastor, you have the teacher. So I'm taking off my evangelist hat tonight and I'm putting on the teacher's hat. Uh, to give you a practical lesson about healing, okay? I'm calling, if you're making notes tonight, you can, you can write down methods of healing. Methods of healing. Wherever Jesus went, healings occurred. The Bible does not say that the people followed him because he was a great preacher. The scripture says they followed him because of the miracles. A miracle settles the issue. When a miracle happens, that's it. You know, you don't need an explanation. I was preaching one night in uh, Belf, see, in Birmingham, uh, Northern England. I was in a, a cathedral-like building, and there were about 4,000 people there. And there was a girl who had come to the service with her mother. She had had surgery on her leg, but the surgery had not gone well. And she was still in a brace that went all the way up to her hip. And God gave me a word of knowledge for her, which we'll get into later, <coughs> later tonight or tomorrow or maybe Sunday. And um, God healed her. And she came up on the platform, and much to my amazement, she took the brace off and demonstrated uh, that she could run and jump on it. She jumped off the platform. Uh, she ran up and down the aisle and uh, demonstrated that God had totally healed her leg. And uh, there was a reporter there that night who wanted to interview me after the service worked for a local newspaper. And I could see by the scowl on his face that it was not going to be a pleasant interview <laughs> and even a less pleasant article because uh, I've dealt with the media before. Yeah. And uh, so uh, I sat down with him after the service and he said to me, how does the word of knowledge work? And I thought to myself, how can I answer the question of this secular journalist? He, he's not going to have a clue what I'm talking about. And there's no telling how he's going to write about it. You know, what, what, what do I say, Lord? And I just quietly began to pray in the spirit under my breath. And the Lord spoke to me and said, don't answer his question. Ask him how long he's had problems with his left shoulder. So I did, and he said, well, how did you know about my shoulder? And I said, well, how long have you had problems? He said, well, several years. And I said, well, if you put your pad and pen down and begin to move your arm, you're going to find your shoulder is completely healed. And he began to move his arm and move his shoulder, and a big smile came on his face, and he said, what did you do? And I said, I answered your question. That's how the word of knowledge works. <laughs> Just works. I don't know how to explain it. It's a sovereign manifestation of one of the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, we'll, we'll get into that. We'll get into that a little bit later, but uh, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I want to, I want to have a demonstration tonight and, and teach you about healing because you are to have a healing ministry. I'm not sure you heard me. You the Bible says, you shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. I, I can't find where it says only Pastor Jeff will lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. I can't find that scripture. It says you, you will lay hands on the sick. And you say, well, I, I'm not, that, that message was to the disciples. No, no. The Bible says, if you are, if you are following me, you're one, you are one of my disciples. Now, we're not Peter, we're not James, we're not John, we're not one of the other, other, not Andrew, no. They're gone, but we're here. And we are those disciples of this day. And each one of us are to have a healing ministry. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have a laying on of hands ministry, 
but you're going to have a healing ministry in the sense that you pray for people's healings. Yes. And that when people see you, they, you represent something to them. It's like the woman seated behind me on a plane. She tapped me on the shoulder and said, I'm so glad you're on this plane. I know we're going to land. <laughs> So let's start, first of all, let's start, first of all, number one, with the laying on of hands. Now, this is the, this is the ministry that I grew up with. I grew up under the, under the ministry of a man who laid hands probably on more people than anyone in the world. Uh, I don't know if anyone has ever laid hands on people in prayer more than Oral Roberts. It's estimated during his effective life, he laid hands on two million people individually. I was with him at times when, when I would walk prayer lines and he would lay hands on nine or 10,000 in one day. So I, I know, I, I, I grew up in that. And I understand the laying on of hands. And he had, a, he had a, an unusual anointing for laying on of hands. And, and God gave him a sign. The power of God would come down his arm and come into his hand. And, and when he was under the anointing, if he touched you, you felt like you had put your finger in an electric light socket because the anointing was so strong. That was a sign. But it was a laying, of hand, laying on of hands ministry. I learned what I know about the laying on of hands through my father, Oral Roberts. And I learned that Jesus laid hands upon the sick. All right, how do you lay hands upon the sick and why don't more Christians and particularly ministers pray for the sick? Why? I think it's because many of them are intimidated and they, they live with a fear of what if nothing happens? Am I going to look bad? I'm more concerned about what they look like than the person's need for healing. Well, when you understand that you are not the healer, that your job is not to heal, your job is to pray, then the pressure is off of you. You can't fail because you're not God. Your job is not to heal. Your job is to pray and to encourage and to help build their faith and not say to them, well, I guess you must not have had any faith, which was the original cop-out that many people have said when they prayed for the sick, nothing happened. Well, you must have no faith. No, 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 that's not true because God has given to every person the measure of faith. You have all the faith you need. You just need to take that faith and use it. So... I learned about the laying on of hands through my father. And uh, it's not rocket science. To lay hands on the sick means you take your hands. <laughs> and you lay them on someone. You don't have to be a graduate of MIT to understand that. Okay? You take your, your hands and you lay them on someone, and you pray. Now, what's so hard about that? It's, it, but somehow people shrink back from doing that. They, they, they're intimidated. They, they don't know what to do. They don't know what to say. And, uh, and so I've, I've been teaching these pastors about uh, preparing themselves so that when they are ready to touch, or let's say it this way, that you don't touch someone until you're ready to release your faith, yes. okay? You don't just walk up and indiscriminately put your hand on somebody and, <laughs> you know, and, and while well, you're eating a sandwich, you know what I mean? You, don't, you, you know, you, 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 you're, in, you're under the anointing, you're, you're, you're prepared, okay? But this, this, is not, this is not rocket science. Stand up for just a minute. See, if I, if I were to use his, him as an example, I was watching you play all those chords. I play guitar too, and I love guitar. Uh, uh, if, I were to, if I were to come to pray for him, I wouldn't just walk up and indiscriminately lay hands on him. I would, I would have already been praying, uh, uh, probably quietly under my, under my breath in the spirit. And, and I, I would come to him and, and, and more than likely I would lay hands on his shoulders. I would lay hands on his neck. I, there, there are certain parts of bodies that I don't touch. Okay. God gave you a brain. You need to use it. Okay. You know. And I don't, I don't ever allow somebody to come up and grab my hand and put it somewhere. You know, I, I, I don't do that either. That's, 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 that's a good word for that. That's called stupidity. Uh, so, but I would already be, be, be prayed up and ready. 
and I would say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I, I lay my hands on my brother. I come against this satanic of the devil. Come out. Loose him and let him go in Jesus' name. Now, how hard is that? <laughs> that wasn't no hard, was it? It's not hard. What's hard is the thought of it. Well, what, what, what do I do if it doesn't work? Well, what if it does? What have you got to lose? You think they're going to get sicker if you lay hands on them? It, it, it's getting past the first step. That's the problem. Now, some of you may be in that category tonight. Maybe you've never, you've never ever prayed for the sick. You never ever prayed or uh, laid hands on somebody. Well, let's change that. Everybody stand up for a minute. Put your books, your Bibles, your notebooks, your cell phones, your smartphones, your dumb phones, whatever phone you brought. <laughs> now turn and face somebody. Let's just have a practical... Let's have a practical thing. It can be your wife or your husband. That's all right. doesn't have to be, but don't leave Christine out. Now, put your hands up like this. Now, Father, in the name of Jesus, when these people lay hands on this person they're standing next to in a moment, something supernatural is going to begin to happen because there's going to be an anointing that comes upon you tonight. I'm proclaiming it. I'm decreeing it. So much so that when you lay hands on them, when they, when they lay hands on that person, the other person who's receiving the touch is going to feel the power of God. Now, when you touch them in a moment, I don't want you to, I don't want you to pray some mamby-pamby prayer. I want you to say something to this effect. You don't have to use these exact words, but I want you to say something like this. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come against this satanic attack of the devil. I bind it in Jesus' name, and I pray for healing. All right? Now, when I count to three, I want you to touch them. Now, you're not going to give them a high five. That's not what this is about. You may want to touch their shoulders. You may want to put their hands on the side of their, of their head or however, you know. Uh, but but when, you, when you lay your hands on them, pray like you mean it. All right? On a count of three. One, two, three. Begin. Father, in the name of Jesus, I release my faith for healing. Satan, take your hands off God's property. Every sickness, every disease, every fear, every doubt, come out. Now, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, now it's not the length of your prayer. Okay? There's nowhere in the Bible where it says you've got to pray a long time. You know, I, I've been in services where people will lay hands on somebody for 30 minutes. It's unnecessary. You don't see Jesus doing that. He touched somebody and he went on somebody else. I, I watched my father do that. You know, he, he would pray and then he'd go for the next person. Okay, now, now everybody look this way. Now, how many of you can say just now when somebody touched you, you felt power come in? All right, now, that's more than half. Now, turn around and find somebody else. I'm helping you to lose your intimidation. This is losing intimidation 101. Okay? Put your hands up. Are you ready? On a count of three. One, two, three. Begin to pray. Father, right now, I release my faith for healing for this woman, for this man. In the name of Jesus. Satan, take your hands off them. I bind every sickness, every disease, every fear, every doubt. Come out. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Now turn around this way. Now how many of you can say, when someone just prayed for me, I felt the power of God. Put your hand up. Put your hand up if you did. Put your hand up. Look at that. Look at that. Almost everybody. All right, now raise your right hand. Say this out loud. Never again, Never again. Will, I be intimidated will I be intimidated to lay hands on someone lay hands on someone. and pray the prayer of faith. Not the prayer of doubt. The prayer of, doubt. The prayer of, faith. The prayer of faith. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Give praise to the Lord tonight. Hallelujah. Okay, you can be seated. I think the prayer that 
hurt my father the most was the prayer that was prayed over him when he was dying of tuberculosis at the age of 17. When his pastor came into his house and said, God, if it be your will, heal this boy. And my grandmother chased him out of the house. <laughs> Literally. Said, if you can't pray a healing prayer for my boy, then don't come back to my house. It is God's will. Third John 2, beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. All right, now the second method, method number two, is speaking the word. There are times when it's not appropriate to lay hands on someone or when it might not be received, it might not be accepted, or it might do that. It might not be, a re it might not be uh, the right circumstances. There are times when it, it, it could be misunderstood. And so there's another method. It's not any better. It's just different. Many times in the Bible, you find Jesus laying hands on the sick. Other times you see him speaking the word and they were healed. Now that's, that's, a, what, that's a ministry that God has given me, particularly overseas. When I've been in crusades with large crowds where there's no way you could pray for people individually. Uh, and that was what Brother T.L. Osborne did the same thing. The, the gifts of healing began to manifest when, when you begin to, to speak prayers out loud. You send the word. And the Bible says in Psalm 107, verse 20, he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. And the illustration I love to give is the story of the Roman centurion who came to Jesus in behalf of his military aid. And Jesus said, I will come and heal him. You know, uh, the, the Roman centurion's base at that time was up in the Tiberias area where the Roman garrison was on that side of Israel. And it was some miles up the sea coast. But Jesus said, I will come and lay hands on him. The Bible says his military aide was grievously tormented with paralysis, with palsy or paralysis. Jesus said, I will come and heal him. The centurion said, it's not necessary. You just speak the word and he'll be healed. And Jesus marveled. He said, no, I've not seen such great faith. Only twice in the Bible did Jesus use the words great faith. Once to a Roman army captain and once to a Lebanese woman the Syrophoenician woman with the demon-possessed daughter. So Jesus spoke and sent the word, and the military aid was healed in the same hour. So we understand that you can, you can send the word. It's just as powerful. It's just a diff it's different. It, it's not any better, not any worse. It's just different. You can send the word. And that's what, uh, that's what I do uh, a lot. I send the word, and I do it especially on television. I send the word. I was preaching for a Creflo Dollar one night, and when I walked on the platform, God gave me a word about backs being healed. And I, and I said, uh, I said before I preach, I'm going to send a word for backs to be healed. And, and when I sent that word, 500 people came forward and testified that when I sent the word, their backs were healed. That's the way to start a service, by the way. Okay. And that, that happens a lot of places where I go. God, God manifests that even, even before I begin to preach. And he's already confirming his word before I preach his word. So, so, uh, so now we're going to do the same thing. So stand up again and put your hands up. Find someone and put your hands up. Now, the only difference this time is you're not going to touch them. You're going to send the word, okay? He sent his word, Becky, and they were healed of their, of their sicknesses and diseases. And there are many times when you can't, you can't touch them. I, I remember I was going on the, on the tram up or the, the escalator in the Dallas airport and a woman was coming down and she recognized me and she said, I've got cancer, pray for me. Well, she was going down, I was going up. I, I couldn't, you know, she was over here. So I said, as she came down, I said, I'm gonna send the word to you. And she came down and I sent the word to her like that. You know, and, and that happens to me all the time. I'm, I, I, I sent the word to that woman yesterday who was on the phone, woman who got my number and I don't know how she got it, you know. <laughs> Uh, I sent the word to her. I gave her that scripture. So you're going to pray the same prayer, same way. The only difference is don't touch them. Just put your hands up. You're not going to give them a high five. No, no high five. You're just, you're, just, you're just going to pray. Are you ready? On three. One, two, three. Begin to pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I send the word. I send the healing word. I send it in Jesus' name for healing for wholeness, for wellness,
for health. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now turn around this way. Now how many of you can say just now when someone prayed that prayer, I felt the power of God. Put your hand up. Put your hand up. Now did they touch you? Okay, find somebody else then. Turn and find somebody else. Let's brad the nail on the other side. Okay? Get your hands up. Are you ready? On the count of three. One, two, three. Begin. In the name of Jesus, I release my faith for healing. Healing in body, mind, spirit, family, finances, every area. Healing. Healing, healing, healing. In Jesus' name, amen. Remember now, it's not the length of your prayer, okay? It's the sincerity of your heart. Now, how many of you can say, just now, when someone prayed for me, I felt the power of God. Put your hand up. Raise your right hand. Repeat after me, never again. Will I be intimidated to lay hands on someone or to send the word of God just like Jesus did? I recognize that he's the healer. I'm the one who prays. He's the one who heals. I don't do his job. He doesn't do my job. Amen. You can be seated. Now, if you had intimidation before, you don't now. Okay? And God will present opportunities for you. Okay? And the more you take advantage of those opportunities, the more opportunities will come. Okay? You're not waiting on God. He's waiting on you. Okay, now there are other methods that you find in the Bible. One is the prayer cloth. Acts 19, 11, they took, Paul the apostle took handkerchiefs and aprons or what we would call cloths from his body. In other words, he had touched them and the cloths were taken to the sick. And the Bible says the sick were healed and uh, the diseases were driven out. It was an ordinary piece of cloth, just like my handkerchief. This is a piece of cotton. It has no healing properties. It's just a cloth. However, it can become a powerful point of contact when used in the Bible-honored way. Now, Something special happens when you lay your hands on a prayer cloth and you send it to someone, if they understand the Bible. Uh, something happens. Um, if I were to take my hand and rub it across my forehead like this, and I were to take it over here to the Aurora, or we're, in a, we're not in Naperville, we're in Aurora. If I take this to the Aurora Police Department, they could do a DNA test and they could discover that the sweat or perspiration uh, or like oil coming out of my skin was me. Yeah. They, could, they, could, they could identify as me. Okay. They use that in forensic, <coughs> forensic uh, medicine for police things. All right. All right. Because my, my DNA, my DNA is in that. Well, I have news. When I lay my hands on this cloth, my spiritual DNA goes into this cloth. And someone can take this cloth from me after I prayed over it and laid my hands on it. And they can use it as a point of contact. But it's just a cloth. It doesn't heal. It symbolizes the one who is the healer. Prayer cloths are extremely important. Uh, over the years, my father and I, uh, now since he's been gone also, probably have sent out, I'm going to estimate, several million prayer cloths. And I remember I had a, I had a prayer cloth project some years ago. I, I think I sent out half a million prayer cloths over a three or four month period. And I, I, I laid hands on every one of them and, and wrote my name on every one of them. Signed, I, I wrote my name on it so people would know it was me. 
and that I had laid hands on. And testimonies came from all over the world. Uh, women would get it and put it in their husband's lunchboxes. Uh, they put it, put it under the floor mat of the car. They'd stick it in the, and they'd sew it into a pillow. Uh, my mother, or my, 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 my wife has a prayer cloth from my father and she has it attached to her bra. And you'll never find Lindsay without a prayer cloth attached to her bra. And my dad was, uh, fears for my dad passed. He, he went into the hospital to have some polyps uh, in his nose cut out. And uh, he was there and my mother had, put, had pinned one of his prayer cloths on his ho- hospital gown. And uh, a, nurse, uh, a, a nurse came in and she, you know, they make you take your jewelry off and everything, you know, when you get ready for surgery. And a nurse came in to take the prayer cloth off. And my mother said, no, 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 don't take that off. That's his point of contact. So he said, he's wearing that in surgery. So uh, one of the nurses was one that had been trained in our, in our dental, or uh, nursing school. And she was in the, in the operating room. And after they cut the polyps out, they couldn't get his nose to stop bleeding. They could not get it to stop. The nurse reached down and took the prayer cloth off of his gown and stuck it up his nose. <laughs> and the bleeding instantaneously stopped. <laughs> she said, the surgeon said, what did you, whatever you did, it worked. <laughs> but it's just a cloth. There's nothing special about the cloth. It's just a cloth. But when used in a Bible-honored way, it's a point of contact. Now, what's a point of contact? A point of contact is something that you do. And when you do it, you release their faith. And that's what I was talking about when I said you don't just go up and indiscriminately lay hands on someone. You, you get yourself prepared. You're, you're becoming a point of contact to that person. And you release your faith through a point of contact. A point of contact is something that you focus on. My father uh, showed me uh, how, um, how a, prayer, a point of contact works. Um, so he pointed to the wall and said, do you see the light switch? Yes. The light switch is a point of contact. In itself, in itself it has no power. But it's hooked up to the power company. And you flip the switch, you touch the power company, the lights come on. He said, the faith in your heart, which you were born with, is just like that light switch. And when you release your faith, you touch God. You touch the power company. Well, I can understand that. He said, now when I pray for you, and you hear me say, in Jesus' name, let your faith go. That's your point of contact. Let your faith go to God. I said, okay. So he laid hands on me and he began to pray. And he came to the point in his prayer when he said, in Jesus' name. And not knowing what to do, being just a child, I just said, faith, get up there to God. (laughs) I didn't know what else to do. Get up there. Get up. And you know, the older I get, the better it sounds. (laughs) Faith, I release you. Everybody take your hand like this and say, faith, I release you. And I believe. I looked at my hand and every wart was still there. (laughs) And he said something to me that I'll never forget. I can hear his words today. He said, son, we have prayed, we have believed. Now let's expect a miracle. I went to bed that night, woke up the next morning, they were still there. Second morning, third morning, fourth morning, still there. Fifth morning, sixth morning, seventh morning, still there. Eighth morning, ninth morning, still there. But on the tenth morning, when I awakened, I looked down, every wart had disappeared. Never had another one on that hand since. And I'm left-handed. But more than that, I learned how to let my faith go. That's worth your whole trip to church tonight. To understand how to let your faith go. Another great point of contact is anointing oil. Now, you'll find anointing oil all throughout the Word of God. Samuel, the prophet, uh, was famous for using anointing oil. He, he would pour it on a, on a king's head, and the, uh, the oil would flow down, you know. And I've been in anointing oil services. I don't know if you, you have, but I've been in services uh, where my dad would pour oil, anointing oil on me. 
he annoyed me a number number of times. I've I've had so much oil poured on me sometimes, I, you know, I, I slid out of the room. You know, <laughs> uh, I had had him pour on me one day. Just ran down my clothes, run down my shoes. Uh, but but uh, something happened in my life when I did. Uh, the anointing oil uh, is a symbol of the power of God. Anointing oil does not heal. It's a symbol. But it's a powerful symbol and a powerful point of contact. Now, I know that there are those who teach that it will work better if, it, if it's oil that has come from Israel. <laughs> if it's come from uh, near the Garden of Gethsemane. Or if it was a tr- uh, came out of an olive tree that Jesus might have passed by. <laughs> it's a certain type of oil. You can use 10W30. It's not the oil. It's who the oil symbolizes. Um, uh, Jerry Savell, uh, my, my dear friend, brother, you all know who brother Jerry Savell? Uh, Jerry uh, told me a story. Jerry is a, is a classic car collector. And he has the most beautiful red 1957 Bel- Chevy Bel Air two-door hardtop that he has taken to car shows all over the country and won the grand prize for that division. And he said, I was, I was uh, at a car show and I was getting ready for my car to be shown and a man walked up and recognized me and said, Jerry, would you pray for me? Uh, I have cancer. And Jerry said, sure. And Jerry said, uh, uh, the man said, would you anoint me with oil? <laughs> Jerry said, he didn't have any oil. So he popped the hood on the car. <laughs> took out the dipstick, (laughs) ran his hand down the dipstick, put it back in, and anointed the man with oil. A few months later, he was at another car show, and the same man came up and said, Brother Savell, thank you for praying for me. I am now cancer-free. But it's not the oil. It's who the oil symbolizes. And uh, as our children were growing up, uh, they're all in their 30s now, but uh, as they were growing up, uh, we would anoint them each night with oil. We'd go into their bedrooms and we would anoint them with oil. And uh, if we forgot or we were late in anointing them, they would yell from upstairs, anoint, anoint, anoint. And we'd say, oh, we better go up and anoint. And Lindsay always had some kind of oil in the kitchen, olive oil, canola oil, something, you know. And uh, she always had something, so we'd get some put on our fingers and go up there and anoint them. But one night, I, I, I didn't have, uh, I couldn't find any oil. But I remembered there's oil in my skin. And so I just went like this. And I anointed them with oil. It's, it's not the oil. It's who the oil symbolizes. And uh, oil is precious. I, I remember receiving a letter from a boy in Arkansas, or parents, I should say, of a little boy in Arkansas. Uh, He had uh, been born deaf in one ear. And my father and I had written a letter about the anointing oil, and we had sent a vial of anointing oil uh, out to all of our partners and told them how to use it uh, the way the Bible describes it. And they got the letter from this family, and they said, our son came home from school and saw your letter and the little vial of oil on the kitchen table. And he took the oil and he poured it into his deaf ear. And God has healed him. Uh, it was a symbol. Got a letter from another woman who said, Dear Brother Roberts, I got the oil. I drank it. I felt better ever since. I've had some crazy testimonies. <laughs> Didn't intend for her to drink it. Certainly wasn't going to hurt her, but <laughs> wow. Uh, perhaps one of the best methods of all, and I'll, I'll close this part of the service with this. Perhaps one of the best methods comes from James 5. Pray ye one for another that ye may be healed. Uh, it is a seed of prayer that you pray for someone else's healing 
believing that that healing will come back to you. It's a terrific way of praying, praying one for another. And uh, oftentimes when I'm in a, when I'm in a place uh, where I'm teaching on this, I will have people do what I'm gonna have you do in a minute. And that is to, to pray for the person on their right and their left, believing that God will use that prayer. And it'll be what my wife calls a boomerang prayer. That it goes out and then it comes back. Some years ago, there was a woman who worked in our ministry who was diagnosed with cancer. And the doctor said, there's nothing more that we can do medically. Uh, You have six months. And uh, so she resigned her job and and went home to prepare her affairs uh, for death. And the Lord spoke to her and said, I want, as you're able, I want you to find people in the city who have cancer and go and pray for them. And as she was able, she went into several hospitals and went into some homes of people that she knew that had cancer and she laid hands on them and she prayed. And three months later, the doctors declared her cancer free. And she came back to work in our ministry and worked for a number of other years before she went home to be with the Lord, but not from cancer. Pray one for another, believing that that healing will also come back to you. So let's close this part of the service by standing one more time. Mm -hmm. Find someone that you have not prayed for tonight. And it doesn't matter to me whether you lay hands on them or whether you speak the word. But I want you to pray and I want you to pray with this in mind that the healing prayer you're praying for them is going to come back and touch you. Are you ready? On a count of three. One, two, three. Begin. In the name of Jesus, I release my faith for this healing miracle. I send the word. I lay hands on them. I release my faith for a miracle. A miracle. In body, in mind, in spirit, family, finances, job, business, marriage, ministry, every area of their lives from the crown of their head to the soles of their feet. And now, Lord, as I pray this prayer, let it come back to me. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Now lift your hand. Pray this or say this out loud after me. Never again again. will I be intimidated to lay hands on someone and pray for their healing healing. or to send the word word. and pray for their healing healing. or to use a prayer cloth cloth. as a point of contact contact. or to use anointing oil oil. as a point of contact contact. or to pray one for another like I just did and believe for that healing to come back to me. Never again again. will I be intimidated. intimidated. I will have freedom freedom. and Lord I'm open open to doing this whenever you choose and to whomever you choose in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Give a shout of praise to the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Did you get anything tonight? What did you learn? What? Methods of healing. Methods of healing. I, I know the title. I, what, 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 what did you get? What did you get tonight? What did you, you learn? Don't be intimidated. Don't be intimidated. The boldness. The boldness. Yeah. What did you learn? What did you get? The what? The power. The healing power. What did you say? The, the, the what? You can send the healing power. That's what you got? What did you get? What did what, you, you hear tonight, Cameron? What did you, what, you hear? I'm a conduit of healing. You're a conduit of healing. Okay. You're a vessel of healing. What'd, you, what'd y'all get over there in the corner? Release the power. Release the power. Pardon? Release the power, Release the power that we got. Yeah. We, 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 we have faith, don't we? Yes. God's given to every person the measure of faith. Isn't it great to know you don't have to go get faith when you got it? You know? You're born with it. Everybody has it. You can't get saved without faith. People say, well, I'll get, you know, you get faith and you get Christian. You couldn't get saved without faith. We're saved by Grace through 
You have to have faith. If you didn't have faith, you wouldn't sit in that chair. You certainly wouldn't get on your highways. If you didn't have faith, amen, you know. You know, I tell people, you know, uh, I, I, I tell people, you know, when you, when you yell at somebody on the highway, don't tell them to go to hell. If you're going to yell at them, tell them to go to heaven. A guy cut me off the other day, I one down the other, I went, go to heaven. I didn't say today, you know. Don't tell people to go, don't tell anybody to go to hell. Tell them to go to heaven. Oh, funny, 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 funny. Be seated for a minute. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> you receive that tonight? Yes. You going to come back tomorrow night? Yes. Tomorrow night, we're going to deal with, with the Holy Spirit. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the background of, of the, the classic mistakes that the Pentecostal charismatic world have made and are making and I'm going to show you the, the classic mistakes that the evangelical world have made and are making. And how we can help bring a change and a difference and bring healing with that, okay? I'm going to give you the history because uh, my father was probably, is probably not only the grandfather of the healing ministry in America, but also is the grandfather of the move of the Holy Spirit beginning back in the early 1960s when, when, the, the, when the Holy Spirit broke out in places across this nation. And I'm going to share that story with you tomorrow night and I'm going to show you how. I'm going to show you how to have the most effective prayer life you've ever had in your life. Okay? Now, as I, as I, taught, as, as I teach this to these pastors, their churches are doubling in size. They're tripling in size. Uh, they, are, they are laying hands on the sick. They're sending the word of God. I just got a testimony from pastors in India that I had laid hands on. Uh, one of their church members was bitten by a poisonous snake. He actually got up in the bed, was in the bed. And uh, uh, a, a vicious, poisonous, uh, life-threatening snake. I don't know what it was, but, but it was a poisonous. And they took him to the hospital and was convulsing and was about to die. And the pastors went in and laid hands on him. And, uh, and he was totally healed. And they, they, they emailed and, and sent the word to me. And the doctors were amazed because nothing they were doing medically was helping the man. They said, he's going to die. Well, uh, he's alive now. And, and, uh, but uh, I'll share uh, that and other testimonies of, about the Holy Spirit and how to make the Holy Spirit a part of your life every day. Uh, most people who pray in tongues pray in tongues at two times. One, when they're very high or happy, and two, when they're very sad. But most of life is between those two points. Most of life is somewhere between the mountaintop and the valley. And I'll show you how to operate in the Holy Spirit every day of your life. And I'm going to tell you a story tomorrow night about a, about a Presbyterian pastor who came to this service in Pakistan just two weeks ago uh, who, who had a un, very unusual experience with speaking in tongues. But that's all I'm going to do. I, I'm not going to tease you with that. Time, okay? So you better come back tomorrow night because I'm going to be here. Okay? And if you're not, I'm coming to your house. I'm going to get a hold of that search engine. I'm going to find your name and your phone number. I'm going to call you and I'm going to find out why you weren't here. Because I haven't been to the Chicago area in about 10 years. And I don't know when I'm coming back, so you better be here tomorrow night. And then you better be here Sunday morning unless you're pastoring your own church and then you get a, you get a pass. <laughs> uh, uh, one thing now before I, before I quit. Um, when my, before my father died, he prophesied over my wife, Lindsay, and said, you are a woman of purpose, you are a woman of passion, and uh, you're a woman of worth, and God is going to use you to minister to women in a very powerful way, and the, the day is going to come when you're going to write a special book, and you wait until the right time, and then you write it, and uh, you find a publisher outside of the ministry, and so uh, she Several years ago, the Lord said it's time, and she began writing a book, and she got a contract with HarperCollins, which is one of the top three book publishers in, uh, in the world. They offered her a contract, and she took it. 
and she wrote uh, the most fabulous book, which has been, uh, uh, it's been as high as number one on the Amazon uh, Christian pneumatology list, of books in that classification. It's in the top 10 right now. And it's called um, Discover Your True Worth. And um, I, the only product that I brought tonight is this book. Uh, it's out there on the table, it's available for purchase. Um, I, I went to bat for her to get, uh, to get em, what do you call it, uh, endorsements for it. Uh, sort of say endorphins, no, endorsements. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, it's endorsed, it's an endorsement by Marilyn Hickey. There's an endorsement by uh, Joni Lamb of uh, Daystar Television. There's an endorsement by Kenneth Copeland. There's an endorsement by Dog the Bounty Hunter. There's an endorsement by uh, Lisa Osteen Comas, Joel Osteen's sister. Uh, there's an endorsement by Kathy Duplantis, Jesse Duplantis' wife. There's an endorsement by Margaret Court, uh, the winningest tennis professional of all time, who's a pastor in Australia. There's an endorsement by Terry Savelle Foy. If you've seen her on, online, she has millions of followers. Uh, she's Jerry Savelle's daughter. She's unbelievably powerful. Uh, and she has a voice like a cartoon character. <laughs> she talks like she's five years old. She endorsed it. Uh, there's an endorsement by Dr. Don and Mary Colbert, uh, uh, the, the health doctor you've seen on, on shows for so many years, and also by Tim Story, who, is the, who runs the Hollywood uh, prayer group uh, to, to the stars. Good friend of mine. We got all these endorsements, but it's a discover your true worth, becoming the woman God created you to be. And I hope you'll uh, get a copy. I brought three boxes of them, and I don't want to take any of them home. So if you don't get one, I'm going to get that search engine. I'm going to call you in the middle of the night. I'm going to wake you up and get you out of bed and tell you why haven't you bought her book? Anyway, it's available out there, and I'll see you tomorrow night.